Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, September's uh, lecture series, The Ism and the Artist. We are going to take a look at neoclassicism, and our second lecture will be on Edmonia Lewis, who is a sculptor in that time. Um, but first, uh, let's learn about uh, neoclassicism. So um, what art movements were the neoclassicists rejecting? So almost every art movement does reject aspects of the prior one, and this was no exception. Um, neoclassicism was actually a Western cultural movement in the decorative and visual arts, uh, also literature, theater, music, and architecture, that drew inspiration from the art and culture of classical antiquity. The primary neoclassicist belief was that art should express the ideal virtues and could improve the viewer by imparting a moralizing message. It had the power to civilize, to reform, and transform society, as society itself was being transformed by new approaches to government and the rising forces of the Industrial Revolution driven by the scientific discovery and invention. So quite a lot for one little art movement. So European uh, neoclassicism in the visual arts uh, began around 1760 um, um, in opposition to the then dominant Rococo style. Now, Rococo architecture emphasizes grace, ornamentation, and asymmetry, uh, which were seen as virtues of the arts of Rome and ancient Greece, and were more immediately drawn from the 16th century Renaissance classicism. Characterized by elegance, levity, floral uh, motifs, muted colors, and curving asymmetrical lines, Rococo soon extended to, um, to painting, where its aesthetics combined with the themes of sensual love and nature, while it ultimately uh, fell out of favor due to this frivolity um, because the neoclassicists really were looking for this much more uh, sober style. And so we take a look at this uh, typical Rococo painting of Watteau and you see this lovely afternoon where everyone's frolicking, waiting for a boat, and we see cupids flying in the air. So very uh, kind of frivolous and, and, and easy, to, you know, easy to look at. It was almost like looking at candy. So So neoclassicism actually developed uh, with the Enlightenment, uh, which was a political and philosophical movement that primarily valued science, uh, reason, and exploration. It was also called the Age of Reason, um, and the Enlightenment was informed by the skepticism of the noticed, noted philosopher uh, René Descartes and the political philosophy of John Locke, as the absolutes of monarchy and religious dogma were fundamentally questioned, and the ideals of individual liberty religious tolerance, and constitutional governments were advanced. So really quite a change. Um, the French Encyclopedia, which we see here, um, represented a compendium of this Enlightenment thought and was really the most significant publication of the century and even had an international influence. Uh, Denis Diderot, also known as the founder of, uh, one of the founders of the discipline of art history, said uh, its purpose was to change the way people think. And historian Cl uh, Clorinda Donata wrote, it argued successfully for the potential of reason and unified knowledge to empower human will and to shape social issues. So again, quite a lot for, for a, a little art movement there. Uh, we also have this gentleman here to thank. Um, Neoclassicism really began in Rome as Johann Joachim Winkelmann's Thoughts on the Imitation of Greek Works in Painting and Sculpture, uh, which was published in 1750, um, really played this uh, leading role in establishing the aesthetics and theories of neoclassicism. The work actually won um, really warm admiration, not only for the ideas it contained, but for its literary style. It made Winkelmann famous and was reprinted several times and soon translated into French. Um, it also went to England and really all around the world. Now, also another big influence on neoclassicism um, was the excavation in 1738 of Herculaneum. And this was then followed by the excavation of Pompeii and Paestum in 1748. Uh, we know about this sudden eruption of Mount Vesuvius in uh, uh, 79 AD or CE. Um, the cities have been covered in volcanic ash and so that these elements of everyday ancient life were actually rediscovered and, and we saw what uh, this ancient like life looked like. Um, Winkelmann also visited these excavations 
and published the first accounts of the ar archaeological finds in his uh, book, The Letter About the Discoveries um, at Herculaneum in 1762. Um, so this really just became this instant classic um, as art historians Francis Haskell and Nicholas Penny wrote, his most significant and lasting achievement was to produce a thorough, comprehensive, and lucid chronological account of all antique art. That included that of both the Egyptians and the Etruscans. Um, he was the first to write of the orderly vision of art um, from beginning to maturity to decline, and kind of looking at a civilization's art as um, intricately connected to the culture itself. So this idea that art and culture um, uh, really uh, uh, flow together and one is not without the other. So neoclassicism rives was, a, was in large part due to the popularity of the grand tour in which art students and of course the general aristocracy um, would, be, uh, would be traveling all around Europe and they would of course come to have seen uh, Pompeii and Herculaneum. And as a result, they became very familiar with the aesthetics and the philosophies of ancient art. So neoclassicism uh, affected the decorative and the visual arts, also literature, theater, music, and architecture. And so the first uh, uh, part we're gonna take a look at is some of the painters of neoclassicism. So Anton Mengs, uh, while painting, uh, originally was a painter uh, in the Rococo period in the mid 18th century, was really the precursor to neoclassical painting. And this really, again, replaced Rococo as the dominant style of painting. So this is actually Meng's uh, oil sketch for his 1761 fresco that uh, he created in the Villa Albani in Rome. Um, it has been described by art historian Thomas Pelzel as among the earliest examples in neoclassical painting in which we find such extended evidence of the use of figures derived from the ancient paintings of Herculaneum. So here's this direct connection but, uh, between the, the excavations and the ruins of these cities that has now been brought to painting. So we've gone from this very flowery painting to again um, extol the virtues of, of, of classic art. Now in Britain, um, the, uh, Benjamin West was one of the main neoclassicists and he um, actually took on kind of a more contemporary message and he emphasized moral virtue um, and the enlightenment rationality. Um, there were uh, other artists such as Joseph Wright of Derby, uh, created works informed by scientific invention. Um, and, but rather than mythological subjects, uh, British artists really turned to classical historical accounts or contemporary history, um, like West, the death of General Wolfe. Um, here he kind of challenged the academic standards, um, uh, refusing the advice to depict the soldiers in Roman togas as, um, and not based on reason or observation. And so this was kind of, a, again, this new idea of all these, these ideas of the enlightenment coming through that you could do this. A little different than the classic neoclassical paintings um, that we'll see now. Um, uh, Jean Auguste Dominique Ang uh, was a French neoclassical painter. Um, he was profoundly influenced by past art artistic traditions and aspired to become the guardian of academic orthodoxy against the ascendant romantic style. Um, although he considered himself a painter of history in the tradition of Poussin and Jacques-Louis David, it is his portraits, both painted and drawn, that are recognized as his greatest legacy. Um, this one here, we see the uh, uh, Napoleon as emperor, and this is in the costume that he wore for his coronation. Um, he's seated here on a circular back throne, and you see on the armrests those, um, those balls of ivory that are there. Um, in his right hand, he holds the scepter of Charlemagne, and in his left, the hand of justice. And on his uh, head is a golden laurel wreath, which would have been similar to the one uh, worn by Caesar. So all these classical artists are, are really going back to the ideas of uh, classical antiquity, but placing them into their, their then modern context. Now, we were also lucky at this point in time uh, to have women artists. We'll take a look at a couple of those. Um, uh, they were much uh, more known as, uh, or better recognized as portrait painters. Um, it was a much more accepted way for a woman painter um, uh, to be accepted and, but definitely a move forward 
from women artists of the past eras. Um, so this is Elizabeth uh, Vigui Lebrun, and she was really a preeminent French portrait painter. Um, her artistic style, again, kind of started in the Rococo, um, and then it adopted the elements of this neoclassical style. Um, her subject matter and color palette, um, um, again, can be classified as Rococo, because we see something kind of flowery there, um, but really is emerged with the, the alliance of neoclassicism. Um, she really created a name for herself in the uh, French ancient regime society, and she was actually the portrait painter to Marie Antoinette. She enjoyed the patronage of European aristocrats, actors, and writers, and was elected to art academies um, in 10 cities. And here we actually see her daughter, uh, Julie Lebrun, um, as Flora. And so again, this idea of bringing um, classical antiquity and applying it to a modern subject. Uh, Angela, Angelica Kaufman was a Swiss neoclassical painter who had a successful career in London and Rome. Uh, she was uh, really known primarily as a history painter, uh, but she was also a skilled portraitist, landscape, and decoration painter. Um, she was, along with Mary Moser, one of the two female founding members of the Royal Academy um, in London in 1768. So quite a feat there that where uh, women are coming out. Um, she produced many types of art, but she, again, primarily identified herself as a history painter. And now this was an unusual designation for a woman in the 18th century, portrait painting being much more, um, uh, much more typical. Um, history painting would have been considered the most elite and lucrative category in academic painting during this period. Um, and the Royal Academy in London had, had a whole lot to say about um, how this would, you know, what would be produced here, much like the French salon. So despite the popularity that Kaufman enjoyed in British society and her success there as an artist, she was dis disappointed by the relative apathy of the British towards history painting. And ultimately, she left British uh, Britain for the continent, where history painting, um, particularly in Paris, was much better established. Uh, Antoine Jean Gros uh, was also a French neoclassical painter. At the Salon of 1804, Gros debuted his painting, um, uh, Napoleon Visiting the Plague Victims of Jaffa. Uh, the painting launched his career as a successful painter. And here we see uh, Bonaparte there in his uniform with his aides behind him, um, visiting uh, the plague victims. Um, um, uh, and these were victims infected with the bubonic plague. And he is por portrayed as reaching out to one of the sick, really kind of unfazed by this illness, like it can't touch me because I am the emperor. So while Bonaparte actually did visit um, the pest house, as it was later called, um, and he did this as his army prepared to withdraw from Syria, he actually ordered the poisoning with laudanum of about 50 of his plague infected men. And this painting was actually commissioned as damage control when word spread of his actions. Um, again, this painting is really in the neoclassical style. Um, Though we kind of have a, a, also a, an idea of the very dramatic here with the light coming in through the arches there. But uh, just very classic in, in its ideals. Um, and again, reflecting uh, modern or antiquity in modern painting. But really the, the, the father of all neoclassical painting uh, was Jacques-Louis David. Um, and he was really considered to be the preeminent painter of the era. In the, eight, in the 1780s, his, uh, his brand of history uh, painting really marked a change in taste away from, again, from, away from this Rococo frivolity towards this classical austerity um, and also the severity and heightened feeling. feeling. It was also really harmonizing um, with, the, the, with the moral climate of the years um, in, the, in the final years of, again, the French ancient regime. So David later became an active supporter of the French Revolution and was a friend of Robespierre um, and who was, a, and was effectively a dictator of the arts under the French Republic. He was actually imprisoned after Robespierre fall from power. Um, he then aligned himself with yet another political regime upon his release, that of Napoleon, the first consul of France. Now, after Napoleon's fall from imperial power and the Bourbon revival, um, he exiled himself to Brussels um, and then into the Netherlands uh, where he remained until his death. But uh, David also had many pupils, uh, making him the strongest influence in uh, French art of the early 19th century, 
um, especially academic salon painting. Uh, this is actually shown at the 1785 Paris Salon. Um, it really kind of exempli exemplified this new idea and direction in neoclassical painting. Um, he completed the painting while he was in Rome, where he associated with Mengs, who we first saw was one of the first precursors. He also visited the runes at Herculaneum, um, an experience that he compared to having cataracts, to having cataracts surgically removed. Um, so really, he was just completely moved by seeing all this and what he could do with his paintings um, with it. So uh, David's influence was really so great that the later period of neoclassicism was really dubbed the Age of David, as he personally trained um, artists, including Anne-Louis Giraudot Trebisson, Francois Girard, Antoine Jean Gros, and uh, Jean-Auguste Dominique Ang, uh, the two of which we've also seen. So we'll take a look at some of his paintings. Uh, the Death of Socrates um, is an oil canvas, um, again, painted by David in 1787. It kind of focuses on this classical subject, uh, like many of his works from that decade. And in this case, this is the story of the execution of Socrates as told by Plato in his Phaedo. In this story, Socrates has been convicted of corrupting the youth of Athens and introducing strange gods and has been sentenced to die by poison hemlock. And so Socrates actually uses his death as a final lesson for his pupils, rather than fleeing when the opportunity arises and really faces it calmly there, still lecturing to his people while that, that dish of hemlock is right there in his hands with his, with his followers looking away from it in, in horror of what's about to happen. So he, uh, David began planning the work for this painting while he was imprisoned in the Luxembourg Palace in 1795. Uh, France was at war with other European nations um, after a civil conflict um, culminating in the Reign of Terror and the Thermidorian Reaction, uh, during which um, David again had been imprisoned as a supporter of Robespierre. Work on the painting commenced in 1796 after his estranged wife visited him in jail. He conceived the idea of telling the story to honor his wife, with the theme being love prevailing over conflict and the protection of children. Uh, the painting was also seen as a plea for the people to reunite after the bloodshed of the revolution. And it took him nearly four years to complete this painting. And again, this is this whole idea of, of art kind of matching society at the time. So this is why he was aligned with Robespierre and then later with Napoleon, because this is, um, and, and, and how the, the French Salon also came about, because that was uh, directed by the emperor. And the next paintings we're about to see, uh, this one is are just humongous. This one is actually 12 and a half feet by 17 feet. Um, and it's just amazing. And this is again, the, the, the Sabine woman trying to stop a war there. You see the lady in between there. And uh, this one will be the last that we see of David. Um, uh, but of course, we're going to end with the coronation of Napoleon, um, completed in 1807. It took him a couple of years. Uh, he was now the official painter of Napoleon and directed and, and here depicted his coronation at Notre Dame. Um, it is almost 33 feet wide by over 20 feet tall. And this is in the Louvre in Paris. If any of you have seen it, it is, it is just an amazing uh, uh, painting. Uh, one of the things I wanted to point out here is that we see Napoleon is crowning his wife, the Empress Josephine, and that the Pope is now in the back. And so he has already crowned Napoleon king, but uh, Napoleon is now saying, I am greater than, than you even. So I do the crowning now. Um, the emperor uh, uh, was actually quite satisfied um, uh, with this painting and was said to have noted, what relief, what truthfulness. This is not a painting. One walks in this picture. David himself, um, who was also at the coronation, realized the significance of this work for the future and for his personal fame, uh, not to mention staying alive and out of prison, saying, I shall slide into posterity in the shadow of my hero. So he knew where his bread, his bread was buttered. So now we're gonna take a look at uh, sculptural works um, in, from neoclassicism, which again, looks very much like 
um, the, the st statues we've seen from ancient Greece and Rome. Um, Antonio Canova was an Italian neoclassical sculptor, uh, famous for his sculptures. He was uh, really regarded as one, as one of the greatest of the neoclassical artists. And his uh, sculpture was actually inspired uh, by the Baroque and the classical revival and um, has been characterized as having avoided the melodramatics of the former and the cold artificiality of the later. Um, by 1800, Canova was one of the most celebrated artists in Europe. He systematically promoted his reputation by publishing engravings of his works and having marble versions of plaster casts made in his workshop. In other words, he was a very good marketer as well, which we all have to be for as artists. Um, he became so successful that he acquired patrons from across Europe, um, including France, England, Russia, Poland, Austria, and Holland, um, as well as many members from different royal lineages. Um, among his patrons, of course, was Napoleon and his family, for whom Canova actually produced a, a tremendous amount of work, um, including several uh, depictions. And uh, one of the most famous here, again, is Napoleon as Mars the Peacekeeper. And so again, this idea of, of putting these, uh, you know, that Mo Mars was the god of war, but here's Mars as the peacekeeper. And this is what Napoleon wants to project to his people. Uh, and here uh, we actually see a nude. Now, nude portraits were rather unusual um, with subjects of high rank usually having strategically placed drapery. And unusual in the fact that this was um, commissioned by uh, Pauline Bonaparte, who was Napoleon's sister. So that was kind of different there. Um, and this is her sister chose how she wanted to be immortalized. Um, it was a matter of debate as to whether she actually posed naked for the sculpture, since only the head is really realistic, um, a slightly idealized portrait of her, while the nude torso is really this neoclassically idealized female form. So Canova was first instructed uh, to depict Pauline Bonaparte fully clothed as the chaste goddess Diana, who was also a hunter and virgin. Pauline, apparently, or allegedly, uh, started to laugh and said that nobody would believe that she was a virgin. She had an international reputation uh, for easy promiscuity um, in France and Italy and may have enjoyed the provocation of posing naked in, the, in Catholic Rome. Further, uh, when Pauline was asked whether she really posed naked in front of Canova, she replied that in fact she was naked and that it did not constitute a problem because Canova was not really a man and the room was too warm to pose dressed. And so we see here, she holds an apple in her hand, um, evoking Aphrodite's uh, victory in the judgment of Paris. Um, and the room in which the sculpture um, is exhibited at the Gallery of Borghese, also in Rome, um, also has a ceiling uh, painting portrayed by the judgment, um, painted by Domenico de Angelis. Um, and again, inspired by a very famous relief on the facade of the Villa Medici. So again, all these ideas of, of classical, um, and, and, and times farther back being applied to the here and now. Uh, this is his, one of his um, more famous um, uh, sculptures that you, you've probably seen before. Um, this is the Three Graces, and this was carved between 1815 and 1817 for an English collector. Uh, we see here this, this incredible group of three mythological sisters. Um, uh, was the second version of an original. And this was actually um, one commissioned by uh, Josephine uh, de, de Beauharnais, who was the first wife of Napoleon Bonaparte. And again, it took its motif from Greek literature. Um, the Three Graces depicts the three daughters of Zeus, each of whom is described as being able to bestow a particular gift on humanity. So from left to right, we have Euros, uh, Euro, Euphrosne, which was mirth, Aglaia, which was elegance, and Thalia, which was youth and beauty. And we were also very fortunate to have some female sculptures, um, one of which we know we'll be looking at uh, in a couple of weeks. Um, but there was actually a whole collection, um, a colony of, of women artists living in Rome at the time, which, uh, and, and this included uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne, uh, Bertel Thorvaldsen, Will, William Makepeace Thackeray, um, there were the two female Georges, uh, uh, Elliot and Sand, and um, also Elizabeth Barrett and Robert Browning. And so at this time, um, Harriet Hosmer was there, and she was really the leading female sculptor of this time, working in Rome. 
and, and really was perhaps the only female sculptor to win complete financial independence through her artistic work. Uh, the sculptor's popularity was such that numerous bus sized versions were carved to meet demand. Um, she was a, a female, uh, American female sculptor, and she was also white um, of the century, and she was really kind of unchallenged in her time. Um, although critical estimation of her neoclassical style, style never afterward really placed her in the first rank of artists. And more than likely, a lot of that was probably also because of her position as a woman. And so here is her uh, Queen of Palmyra, is again, just a, again, this beautiful, beautiful sculpture here. Now, Nathaniel Hawthorne actually said of her, she was very peculiar, but she seemed to be her actual self and nothing affected or made up. So that for my part, I gave her full leave to wear what may suit her best and to behave as her inner woman prompts. So again, the, the men commenting on, on what women should be or should not be um, uh, doing, but just amazing that these women uh, succeeded in this time at all. So she also, the kind of women's group that she hung out with was Ann Whitney, Emma Stebbins, Edmonia Lewis, uh, Lu Louisa Lander, Margaret Foley, Florence and Florence Freeman. Um, Hawthorne was uh, also described them um, uh, in his novel, The Marble, Marble Fawn, um, and uh, called them a sisterhood of American lady sculptors. As Hosmer is now considered the most female sculptor of her time, um, she was credited with having led the flock of the other female sculptors. Um, and again, she really became a favorite uh, among many artists and um, th there was another, uh, they were actually referred to by Henry James as the white marmarian flock or the white marble flock, which is kind of uh, very interesting. But again, uh, they persisted, which was amazing. And now we'll take a, a quick look at uh, Edmonia Lewis. Uh, she was born Mary Edmonia, Edmonia Lewis or Wildfire. Um, and she was a black American in sculpture. She was of mixed African American and Native American um, heritage. Um, and she was from the Ojibwe tribe. Uh, she was born free in upstate New York and worked for most of her career in Rome, Italy. And she was the first black American sculptor to achieve national and then international prominence. Uh, she really began to uh, gain prominence in the United States during the Civil War at the end of the 19th century. And she remained the only black woman artist who had participated in and recognized uh, to any extent by the American artistic mainstream. So pretty amazing. Um, in 2002, the scholar Molefi Kete Asante named Edmonia Lewis on his list of 100 greatest African Americans. Um, her work is known for incorporating themes related to Black people and Indigenous peoples of the Americas into the neoclassical style sculpture. And she will, of course, be the subject for our next lecture. Um, and it was really, truly amazing uh, what she accomplished considering these barriers uh, to enter. So her Roman, she uh, got enough money from selling sculptures in America, uh, moved to Rome, um, it was kind of a required stop because she's again among this whole group of lady uh, sculptors for the money, uh, a stop for the money class on their grand tour when they would also go see Herculaneum in Pompeii. Uh, Frederick, Douglass, Frederick Douglass visited her. Ulysses S. Grant sat for her. She made busts of John Brown, Abraham Lincoln, and Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, um, uh, whose Song of Hiawatha would actually inspire her to do uh, many uh, portrait busts of Hiawatha and Minnehaha. Um, her sculptures actually sold for thousands of dollars and she had commissions from wealthy patrons on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, she had a, a, a tendency to sculpt historically strong women um, as demonstrated not just in Hagar, uh, but also in, uh, she did a whole series on Cleopatra, which we'll see in the next um, lecture. Um, Hagar is inspired by a character from the Old Testament the handmaid or slave of Abraham's, uh, um, uh, Abraham's wife, Sarah. Um, being unable to conceive a child, Sarah gave Hagar to Abraham in order to bear him a son. Hagar gave birth to Abraham's first son, Ishmael, and after Sarah gave birth to her son, she resented Hagar and made Abraham cast her into the wilderness. And so we see her going out there like that. 
Um, but Lewis really kind of uses Hagar here to symbolize the African mother in the United States um, and the frequent abuse of African women. Uh, the, this is uh, uh, one of her more famous sculptures. Um, uh, the words forever free are taken from Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation of 1863. And this white marble sculpture represents a man standing, staring up and raising his left arm into the air. Wrapped around his left wrist is a chain. However, the chain is not restraining him. Um, to his right, a woman is kneeling with her hands held in a prayer position. The man's right hand is gently placed on her shoulder. And so Forever Free is really the celebration of Black liberation, salvation, and redemption, and represents the emancipation of African-American slaves. Um, and this was right after the Civil War that this was done. Um, so it symbolizes that. Um, and while, um, uh, and really just this, this, this beautiful work and just very evocative again, they're kind of dressed with the, the beautiful marbling there. And, and uh, again, putting that neoclassical style, first of marble, and then also just the work itself. Um, and this piece is held by Howard University Gallery of Art in Washington, DC. But neoclassicism did not affect just painting and, and visual arts or visual arts and sculpture, sculpture, um, but also architecture. So I just wanted to take a quick look at, at um, some of the architecture examples um, that, that it were inspired uh, again by this uh, by Piestum and, and and Pompeii and uh, Herculaneum, and uh, this this gallery here or this photograph here um, shows the National Gallery of London, uh, located in Trafalgar Square, and uh, again it, it, this very neoclassical building uh, based on on um, classical arch architecture, um, and this was created by William Wilkins and it was open to the public in 1838. Um, we see here the Arc de Triomphe du Carousel, um, and this was modeled on the Arch of Constantine from the year 312 in Rome. Uh, so again in Paris, so again we see these, this, this, uh, this wonderful in neoclassical influence uh, based on the past but put into the, the then present. Uh, Giacomo Quarenghi actually arrived in St. Petersburg um, along with the Scottish architect Charles Cameron. Uh, and they were, a, he was a renowned uh, neoclassical architect having studied in Rome with none other than Anton Mengs, who we know kind of started all of this thing. And he really helped shape the interest in Palladian architecture. And uh, this is, uh, they worked on the Catherine Palace and this uh, wonderful um, construction of this hallway there, uh, located in the Hermitage, the main museum there in St. Petersburg. Um, this is the West Portico of Thomas Jefferson's renowned plantation home, um, exemplifying this neoclassical style, um, again influenced by the designs of the Venetian Renaissance architect Andrea Palladio. The portico employs four uh, colored columns, again rising to this triangular pediment to create this grand but harmonious um, really ordered entrance, which was also something that is this, this, this order and this beautiful entrance to come in. And this next one, I believe you'll be very familiar with. And again, this whole idea of a grand entrance. Um, so uh, this was uh, designed by the Irish born architect, James Hoban, and again, in this wonderful neoclassical style, um, kind of base, that looks a lot like the Parthenon. Um, he actually modeled the building um, on Leinster House in Dublin, a building um, which houses the Irish legislature. So kind of the same, um, Gravi to it, but again also has details that echo this classical Greek um, Ionic gar architecture. Uh, so again, this this uh, primary belief, uh, the primary neoclassic uh, classicist belief, was that art should express the ideal virtues in life and could improve the viewer by imparting a moralizing message. According to the artist here. Neoclassicism had the power to civilize, reform, and transform society. And as society itself was being transformed by new approaches to government and the rising forces of the Industrial Revolution, driven by scientific, scientific discovery and invention. So I hope you've enjoyed this quick look at neoclassicism and, and just get the idea that it was a, a way to impose virtue and order on society, uh, working in conjunction uh, with the politics of the time 
but again, uh, creating these, these beautiful sculptures and architecture and paintings. So we will see you next time for Edmonia Lewis. <laughs>